Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. Good evening and welcome to tonight's um, education tonight. It's the 3rd of October. We've survived September. Woo! Just about. The lurgy has got me already. It's quite, a, it's quite a funny, isn't it? You just see that kind of, just that just that drop-off in attendance that kind of uh, hits around this team. You've already been hit. I've, I've been hit now, so I've got the voice of um, the late Christ- Christopherson, God rest his soul, or Rubber Ducky, Rubber Ducky. You know, every hair of Rubber Ducky that couldn't swim, Chris Christopherson. Come, big, big convoy. And I, so I'm, I'm, I'm now got the voice of a country and western singer, which is great, you know. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you, hopefully you can hold, hopefully Brent can hold his voice uh, for tonight. And uh, we've got a really good show for you tonight because we are, well, I guess it's good news in one respect, is that we are finally getting a, a curriculum review, something we've been banging on about for a while, Brent. You know, that we've said our curriculum has been out of date. Maybe this is the source of attendance problems, the source of kind of uh, motivation issues within the teaching staff. We're teaching curriculum that doesn't is not fit for purpose. So uh, that's part of our discussion tonight. And our second story um, after, after half past is, we're going to be looking at uh, this crisis that's coming up with uh, teaching assist- assistants. Uh, we've all been in that position, hopefully we've had uh, great teaching assistants. I don't think um, teaching would be the same or could happen even uh, without our um, army of uh, teaching assistants that uh, really do support the teaching of uh, people with some sometimes quite serious and complicated needs in our um, education system. So uh, we'll be covering that because I think it's definitely deserving of a kind of uh, a shout out. I think um, depleted, depleted army is definitely the the sort of a uh, the statement, isn't it? Much like the mirroring the recruitment and retention crisis in in teaching itself, there is a parallel recruitment and retention crisis in teaching assistants, and I think they are inextricably linked and there is obviously a, a, a knock-on effect for teaching assistants with a lack of teachers and, and equally there's a paying conditions issue um and, and that's obviously now biting in and then there's a triple whammy which is the increase in send demand so mm-hmm. this again this the squeeze of increase in demand reduction of supply and more demanding parents and yet we have a kind of rear guard action to use your analogy of an army the rear guard mm-hmm. action by the remaining teaching assistants who are i think basically undervalued financially and even sometimes in some schools they aren't i think given enough credit for the job that they do so we'll hit that after half eight um um so we split the kind of show in half so uh, now you know kind of what's coming up uh, please feel free to kind of comment in i see a mug (laughs) i see a mug i see a mug mug. Tom, this? Tom, where's, oh, where's this? my mug? <laughs> He's using my cover. The other one's dirty in the sink. That's my mug. Anyway, shall we just say a quick hello to the partners of the show? We've got a big hello to um, John Katz. Hi, John. Um, Hi, John. We've got a bunch of T-shirts. We've got the T-shirts, yep. Um, this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cut Educational, publishers of uh, professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Level up your professional development today and visit johncutbookshop.com to explore a full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. And we're also pleased to be uh, supported by uh, Reading Solutions UK, which is the home of Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development programme. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond. Uh, GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Uh, Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and uh, places them on a professional learning pathway built to accelerate their strengths and improve on areas for development. You can try the program for a with a free uh, four-week trial today, or three-week pilot, sorry, uh, in search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request their um, the, the pilot from there. Um, 
thank you very much for the support that those uh, groups kind of give those those companies give us obviously uh they're, they're great and also they obviously enhance your professional um development and also support students um so i'll scroll in through the internet well, well, actually you've got one important group of people as well that might be out there there are the potential future high mind teacher talk radio hosts oh, yes, that, um, so um if you are interested and, and you, you've got lots of opinions teachers with opinions who knew and, and you fancy doing some CPD because doing this is actually a little bit of CPD. Okay. It's good That's banter, true. good fun. It helps actually um, open doors. I've had lots of uh, comments about it, make connections. And I know that some people in Teachers Talk Radio have gone on to actual careers uh, connected to even broadcasting and also further in education. So something good in the CV, and actually it's something good fun as well. So uh, if you are interested in joining us, then DMs are open uh, and come and join the Teachers Talk Radio Hive Mind. I think we're two years. I think we're just past two years now, aren't we, Adam? Yeah, possibly. It's all it's all been kind of a, a bit of a, of a kind of blurb, if you say so. That's that's kind of because I think we started yeah, think... started doing podcasts and then we kind of went on to extroverts and now we're kind of obviously uh, which you can see us, which is which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I was doing a quick search of the internet kind of the other day. I was talking to my uh, my two daughters about uh, kind of bags that we took to school. Um, and do you remember this bag? Because this oh, this, yeah. this, this really kind of took me right back. Obviously, 90s is very much in vogue with kids at the minute. And my kids were loving it. They go, that, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but literally, I don't know. Virtually Mine was an admiral. Okay. <laughs> 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 next level down from Umbro. Oh, okay. Is, yeah, so I had Admiral, which I think this might, this might be the English school kind of um, kind of equivalent, I think. Get, no, there were people who had that bag. I mean, it okay. faded quite badly. And it does remind me of the um, the white high-tech boots. Remember those big, giant, white high-tech boots? And you yeah. used to have the white stuff that you'd have to put on those big, white high-tech boots and mullets. I mean, we all had like the mullet from the kid out of Terminator Two, you know, the spiky hair at the top. Did you, what? Did you have a mullet? No, I, I went, I went, I went Jason Donovan like wedge. Oh, you, oh, you went curtains, did you? You, you, oh, you were so indie. You went curtains. <laughs> no, I was so heavy metal man. I had the whole Iron Maiden, a couple of Eddie T-shirts, the torn jeans. Um, but man, I had the legs like two bean poles, the torn jeans, the socks that were white. And the jeans were halfway up, and you know, yeah, I had that look, and, and the ripped, mm -hmm. torn, sleeveless, you know, that was me. It's just just interesting, kind of one thing you see as a teacher, don't you? You see these kind of, especially if you've been in the game for a while, like we have, you kind of see these kind of trends kind of come and go. But I never really thought I'd kind of uh, see Bridget the kind spinners. of like, <laughs> nine. Yeah, that that'll be the kind of at the end of our career probably that'll be our kids going into teaching at the end, like when they're forty, their what kids. At pencil cases, I remember like 10 years ago, there was an online influencer called Zoella or Zoella. And I was like, every time I heard that, I was like, everybody's free to feel good. And I'm like, took me back to the 90s. And they're like, I remember kids were like paying £25 for um, a plastic 10 pence um, Zoella with eyebrows um, mm. pencil case. But one of the things I've noticed recently, kids don't use pencil cases any longer. <laughs> a pencil case has gone out of fashion. To be fair. To be fair, actually, this year I've been pretty impressed so far. I mean, like as I said, like, I made a joke about getting to October, um, but I've been pretty impressed by the classes thus far with with equipment. Um, I don't know if it's kind of become with kind of some of the brands on the high street actually selling stationery again. Um, some of those have become quite fashionable, mm -hmm. haven't they? I wonder if it's become like a bit of a fashion thing to actually uh, bring equipment to school, which is kind of ironic because we've had years of scraps of pencils or kind of the betting slip pen kind of could come and come out all the I, I check every morning I, I i made it one of my standards checks is pen pencil ruler calculator reading book that's my my standard and, and mm. uh it's interesting i had um over, over the last couple of months i've had a student to pretend that their eye pencil what they call them, one of those coloring pencils for their eyes right, right, um, so. that one um oh, they oh, 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 they are, you talk about eyelashes or yes so they tried to pretend that was an actual pencil. I'm like, great. I had another student who tried to tell me that I line, a, marker, I line, a, marker, a marker was a ruler because he could draw a straight line. I'm like, could you show me 10 centimeters on that marker? I've had another one try to use all sorts of makeup as, as, as pe fake pens. I'm like, let me see that pen. Is that actually a pen? You're like, no, it's not, sir. So I've got used to now like pen, pencil, ruler. And yeah. because we've got blazer, they, they they basically store everything in their blazer. And yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially what my daughters do. We kind of like on a, on a Friday, we kind of move their blazers, and the whole kind of world falls out of the, 
Fucking <laughs> get some of the week. Sprinkles all over. I'll sprinkles all over the floor. Um, so, should we get to kind of rocking with our with our first story? Because I feel like we've got a lot to unpack here. Um, so, the, I'm enjoying uh, this nostalgia. This is good. Yeah, be- of course, yeah. Maybe we could do a kind of flashback show at, at some point, and you can dress in your kind of '80s school. We could do a, like a, a school disco uh, teachers talk radio, oh, and we could we could we could wear what oh, all the good old school discos. The yeah. only way is up. I mean that that's it. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm emailing. I mean, I'm emailing Tom as it is to kind of set up a channel for. You know, oh, no, no, no. Teachers talk radio, it's, school disco. School disco. Right. So the boys sit, in, boys sit in one corner. The girls sit in the other corner. And nobody talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what's in vogue at the minute to get people's attention? Is it hands up? Is it a, is it a clap to get attention? We need to kind of crack oh, sorry, on. We, <laughs> we need to we need to crack on. So. Uh, Cricket and Review Brent, so uh, we've been kind of asking for it for a while. It's kind of come up on our kind of Venn diagrams a few times, the things that t- th- this this curriculum uh, review is required. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden it's kind of, it's, it's there. Uh, the DOV posted on their website, uh, so we can kind of show that, uh, what that screen looks like. Um, it's on gov.uk. Um, so they're looking for kind of, um, oh, hello, Tom. Uh, hey, well, legends. Legends. Oh, I don't know if that background is the right background for Tom. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> He's back up to me. No, no, don't, don't diss him while he's there. Right. So, um, calling for evidence, inviting people to share the following. Um, so, if we can put this uh, screen up um, for, for everyone to kind of see, um, the review panel is running a call for evidence, inviting people to share the following their ideas for potential improvements to the curriculum and assessment system, what works well in the current system, and details of anything that doesn't. Um, So essentially, we've got a classic teacher feedback of www and an EBI comments uh, going forward. So they're following kind of uh, the classic kind of teacher feedback. So um, so we do it tonight. So we give them an, a what, what works well, and you know, basically what doesn't work so well. Well, my first thing for the moment has to be, I'm sick of everything being piled into an overstuffed curriculum. We cannot keep teaching the amount of content science. Three science and kids are overloaded, and I don't care how many knowledge retrieval tasks you do. There's only so much information you can cram into a child's head at 14 when their brain has been rewired. And if I'm struggling and I'm an ed- educator to keep up with the amount of content, God knows how a child is doing 11, 12 GCSEs, each coming with ridiculous question stems, trying to catch them out. It's just trying to catch them out and fail them. It's just it's a tripping up system. It's not getting the best out of our kids. So you have to look for me. It's all right just doing the curriculum again, but. Well, should, we, should, we, should we look at our our uh, our areas of expertise then? So let's hmm. if you look if you look to geography or history or uh, one of the subjects you're well, this, you know, in the last couple of years, that's geography, history, physics, English, PHSC, <laughs> um, computing, and anything else you want me to do. Okay, yes, yeah, so, yeah. So, sorry to kind of scratch that for you, but the the hmm. if if we go kind of history, I guess kind of that's what your kind of no, that's what your kind of expertise is uh, with geography. But if you're if you're stripping curriculum. What are what are you stripping? Are you are you taking out complete topics? Are you kind of getting a, getting getting away from some of the? Are you thinning out some of that content? Is that the best thing to do, or is it kind of keeping the content or looking at another way of assessing it? Maybe. I think you, you do everything in that because because the Govian agenda was all knowledge based and overloaded. Mm. Right, that's great. Knowledge base is important to a certain extent, but we live in a world where children can find out knowledge quite quickly. We don't have the breathing space to teach, I think, some of the critical skills. And when you talk about, you know, what really is the essence of what I need as a history teacher, it is about discussion debate. I don't have time to discuss and debate because it's like too much. There's just far too much. I've got a thousand years. I'm doing a unit at the moment, which goes from Magna Carta right up to Stonewall, right up to LGTB, right up to... But the question is, the the question is to, to kind of defend the Gobian kind of policy on content. Until you've got the knowledge and you're secure with that knowledge, it's very difficult to build upon that. So that was the kind of the argument, wasn't it, that... Completely agree. Students don't have the knowledge, yeah. and although it would be great to say, you know, 
because I've had this, well, I, I, I have this feedback generally. It seems to be all the feedback I ever get kind of from lesson reviews and whatever, um, that could that be better done as like a flip yeah. learning experience, whatever. And I said, yeah. that's great, but what do I do when only five of them have done it? And five of them can bring it back into the class. So I tell you what happens. A lot of children turn around and say, I'm going to prioritize that subject, that subject, that subject, that subject, because they're overloaded. Mm -hmm. So what you end up is you end up getting by outcome, some children just opting out. You want to talk about attendance? They're just opting out. They're switching off. They're, they're doing, yeah. they're just giving up because the curriculum is just too much for them. I mean, I spend tonight, I do this on Thursday nights and I sit down with the kids and have a cup of tea with them. And, and they do some revision, have a chat with them, how they're feeling. And part of that is to take the temperature down, take the, take the pressure off, let yeah. them know how they're feeling because it's just too much. It's far too much content. And, when I, and, and we're siloed, you know, this whole competition between subjects. We need to integrate subjects. We need to start integrating subjects and linking them together a lot more. But the, the idea in some schools, subjects are practically in competition. And you get that when they say, you know, well, they could do it in this subject. Why can't they do it in the other? I'll give you an example of that. I teach both concurrently geography and history. My results for both subjects are very widely different. Of course they are, because the competency and skills needed. Now, you tell me why some of my students do better in geography and history. And I will tell you, because they can walk into the exam, they get a graph, and they can work it out. Which my historians, they have to know it. They have to really know it, really, really, really know it. It's too academic. Mm. And it's too much for some children, especially the working class children who have gotten none of those advantages of cultural capital, who can't go and visit the Globe Theatre. They haven't got the facilities. They haven't got, I don't think, the learning profile to do it. So really what we need is we need to go back to more vocational, more, less emphasis on every kid writing an essay, less emphasis on terminal exams, measuring the children's actual ability. So the curriculum needs to be fit for purpose for the 21st century and not 1960s grammar schools. Because that's really what it's ended up. It's ended up like 1960s grammar well, schools. Well, it's, well, it's, it's certainly looking at that bag, <laughs> the curriculum definitely hasn't changed since we were at school. I mean, that's kind of almost like a given. So the, the things they're doing are, <laughs> we, we, we had a conversation tonight about um, home economics. Um, that it was home, like when my, when my wife was at school, there was, was home, it was home economics. And it was basically split between kind of food and textiles and some other things like sewing. And uh, I think she, I think she actually said she did ironing at, <laughs> at her school, uh, only a few years kind of before, before us. And then um, when I went to school, that was home economics brackets food. And then Lila, Lila laughed, laughed at me and said, it, that's the same as it is now. I thought that's unbelievable that this thing is still called home economics in 2024 is you know it's, it's phenomenal really it shows how little kind of um you know evolving the curriculum has done or, or, or schools have done to match and then if you look at the difference between how society shifted in that time there's it hasn't changed the school system almost is is paralyzed isn't it, it, it it's been well, I'll, I'll give you an example and 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 tom rogers and obviously the guys that were up at the history conference i i sort of um took a risk because i was in a room of people who I respect and people whose textbooks I've been using for years. And my basic play was, why are nobody teaching the Middle East? When you look at what's going on in the world right now, why are yeah. none? 555 students in the whole country are doing a module about Iran, Iraq, 9-11, the Gulf War. What are we all teaching? I tell you what they're teaching. They're doing Germany in the interwar years because in an over overpopulated curriculum, they're narrowing the curriculum because they're under pressure to get results. So they're gaming the system, not for the children's benefit. And that's the problem with the curriculum. At the moment, schools are playing games, point scores, bucket, open bucket, closed bucket. Who gives a crap about a bucket? I am sick of hearing about the priority of a school to meet league tables. Yeah, so this, 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 is, the, this has been tied in. Really, Sorry, bro, this has also been tied into the Ofsted thing, hasn't it? About basically kind of the idea was from head teacher, I think generally head teachers kind of thought, if I gain the system and I kind of get good results, I then Ofsted leave me alone and I retain my job because the school stays good, outstanding, whatever. So that that's the game, isn't it? So we, we, we talked about reforming Ofsted, but obviously that plays a part with this because ultimately they're the they're the they're the checkers here, aren't they? They're the people checking kind of You are judged by your results as a teacher. Yes. And again, to quote Tom again, and that's not fair because they're not our results, they're the students' results but we're under so much pressure. And this is why I can't blame some teachers for doing that. They're under pressure to get results. They will cut corners in the sense that they will say, right, I'm gonna make sure those kids learn less content by doing two units which are too similar. So what do you end, what do you end up getting? Children who go through GCSE history, 
have a narrow, narrow, oh, Nazi Germany, the Treaty of Versailles, way. That's the same thing they were taught. It's the same thing their parents were taught. Instead of, actually, what they really need in the world going on at the moment. We talk about critical thinking. I, I, I think it's, and I wonder, I could stand up there and teach history lessons, which debate, discuss, all those great things. We do it at Key Stage 3, which really irks me. Key Stage 3, you've got barnstorming, fantastic lessons. You get to Key Stage 4, it's like, Sorry, guys, the fun is over. Grind, 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 grind. And you well, it's, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a filtering that comes from key stage two, isn't it? So we've talked before about this oh, vast, vastness of kind of the year, year four, year five. Sats kind of kills that off. Year seven, year eight again widens, and then it gets very narrow towards the top. By the time say, you... I want a curriculum that's fun. I want a curriculum that I want to teach as a teacher or I can have fun. I mean, maybe that's a maybe that's a dirty word in education. I mean, what is wrong in having a little fun in education? And you know, you take the, the, the school trips, the coursework, geography, for instance. One of the most exciting things about when I was doing geography when I was a kid, I, I had a kid the other day, and I've kept two two items from my GCSEs. One is a big giant, I'm gonna bring it on one 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 um teacher talk radio, a big giant sculpted the head. This thing freaky. It looks like something out of um what's that predator? Basically, I was in a dark place when I was a kid and I produced this big giant head. And I brought it into school about 10 years ago when we were doing our masters and we we're talking about motivation. I wanted to share the idea of what, you know, how do we motivate kids? How, what motivated me as a kid was art. I went into the art room, I love my art teacher. I intrinsically just enjoyed, enjoyed doing pottery. Coming home to man at that, there's an ashtray, and she still got it. And it's the ugliest darn thing in history. That's my ashtray. I made that. I don't think, I mean, I used to love going down to the DT room. And the DT guys would lay out the DT room. And you used to have this in your school as well, because it was a DT specialist. And the kids would make chairs, they'd make this, they'd make that. And you go, wow, look at that chair, look at this. And it's like, yeah, and then tick the box, tick the box. Tick the box. Where yeah. is the intrinsic fun? And where's the where's the literal joy in subjects? It's been knocked out of our children. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean bizarrely, that that type of thing that you talk about only really happens now in smaller groups where kind right. of they, where, where the school has decided to do some kind of alternative curriculum because they they know basically those children cannot you know do do the GCSE for whatever reason, and then you know. then, you, then you actually see loads of innovation. And loads of great teaching and loads of fun lessons. Bizarre. Tell me why some parents are saying their child's going to be homeschooled because they're doing forest yeah, schools, sure. they're doing yeah. arts and crafts, they're doing all this stuff. I've got friends who you know homeschool their children. And they've got their own curriculum and they network together. Intelligent people and they're saying, "I want my child to be creative. I want my child to have this experience." And I keep seeing on their on their social media posts, they're out at museums, they're out doing these enrichment activities. And here's me stuck in a classroom going. Retrieval task, retrieval task, retrieval. Oh, we've got to get this done. Too much information. Ah, like a block at this one. Fast, stress, 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 stress. For God's sake. Mm. What are we doing to these kids at 14, 15, 16 years old? We're overloading them. And then you see the exam stress kicking in. They don't think they're good enough. We get under stress and we pass it down to the kids. It's not just curriculum. It's the whole modus operandi of what the purpose of education is. And that's the wrong thing that they think that they're going to skirt around curriculum. Because for me, skirting around curriculum is just where we've done it, tick the box. I think this is just cynically me kicking in. It's another tick boxing exercise. We've yeah, done a new curriculum. It's, 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 so you're saying actually we need to think higher and we need to think about a set, set, of, set of values that's going to hold curriculum together for the next whatever number of years. So almost like business would do like a strategic plan and say so what is the vision for the next five to ten, ten years? and then kind of build the curriculum under it because without that all we're going to do is basically kind of decide that home economics is going to be called food and you know business studies is going to be called enterprise i mean yeah because i mean i i lament one of the curriculum changes that the previous government made when i was ahead of citizenship i thought actually thought citizenship was a really good um subject and I spent a lot of my life force and time doing international schools democracy voting Big society, and funny, the next next government came in, Dave Cameron's government. I thought, oh, great, he's talking about big society. Surely you'd want to keep, you know, you'd want to keep that. No, because it was a labor initiative, they didn't touch it. So, no disrespect to the last governments, they politicize education for their own ends. They need to stop doing that. That they need to do what is right for our children, not right for headlines, league tables, and scoring points against each other. Under us, our government education improved. Here's a, some statistics that are completely massaged and false. Stop it. Stop it. Our children's futures are far too valuable. They only get one shot at their education. 
and I'm sick and tired of them being one experiment from one non-specialist to an unknown specialist education minister. Let's get the experts involved. Let's get teachers like ourselves involved. Let's listen. And this is the thing. It's not going to be an exercise in tick boxing going. They've got to listen to us professionals. And one of the reasons, and even the kids themselves, I'm going to say, you know, kids and parents, what curriculum do they want? And I know you say, well, okay, kids don't want this, that that is, they can't make a judgment. We chose our options and I didn't regret choosing my options at 13, 14, 15. Kids know what they like. So why don't give them some advocacy? Why don't give them a little bit of control? Why don't give them a little bit of, of kind of responsibility? You take that subject, you choose that subject, guess what happens? You get more motivated when you're more buying into it well, rather than having it done to you. But just, just a call from the kind of the government, what DAV are asking for. They're asking for quite a range of stakeholders to kind of participate in this. Uh, they want students, which is good, I think. Uh, pupils and learners. Okay, I, that's one of those like masses things that we did. What's the difference between a student, pupil, and learner? <laughs> it's funny how they looked at like, three different categories. Uh, parents and carers, uh, teachers, tutors, and lecturers, head teachers and senior leadership, uh, wider school, college, university workforce, researchers, academics, educational experts, employers, good. Um, often because they'd obviously get sidetracked sometimes. Uh, yeah. local, local authority officers, Okay, that's interesting. Are there any left? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. Shout out the one person that's left in a council house somewhere. The guy sitting in himself in a, in, you know, in a, in a cracked window going, This yeah. used to be the local that's authority. Me. That's me. <laughs> and I'm now cutting the grass for no yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and obviously, kind of at the bottom, um, any, anyone interested. They say they said that this is not a consultation, and we are not seeking views on uh, specific recommendations at this stage. This is a call for um, um, evidence. Um, so I think you've got a recommendation there, Brent, from uh, JBL, uh, Billy Collins, the lanyard. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> but, uh, what you just said about the clay ashtray, but for him it was a lanyard made at summer camp. You're absolutely it's that. Yeah connection to your learning yes. and that connection to your learning that i think lives you beyond i i took out I, I meant to finish that i i had a student turn around and say to me oh it's really hard to do all these things what was it like when you were at school and in my cupboard which i have cleaned out i have my old gcse coursework which was handwritten and i took it out and put it in front of this kid and he went why have you kept that because i'm proud of it i'm proud of it it's 126 pages long but what did i do i went up to the Mourn mountains and i basically measured the bank full width, the bank full depth. I can tell you now, 30 odd years later, exactly what I did because that, I did that. It was my coursework. My teacher helped me, facilitate it. But I got into the river, I measured it. I went to an outdoor pursuit center. It was one of the greatest educational experiences. I didn't go so far as to say that probably encouraged me to do A-level geography. Mm. And probably was back in my mind thinking, gosh, I can look at the world and see the world. I made connection what I was learning at school to what I was learning in the outside world. Yeah. And part of that was the experience of going out and doing field work, honest to goodness field work. Does that happen any longer? No, we have a field work paper in geography, which is fake because you go out and you do a field work study, theoretically, but you don't do the coursework. You don't sit no. down any longer. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to live you've got to live your subject, aren't you? But I do think I'll hold you on to that quote there. I think that's a that'd be a great line for a country and western song. I got yeah. into the river. I, I, I can see that kind of being merged into a kind of a country and western song. Um, the, the government is saying that they want the review to ensure the curriculum appropriately balances ambition, excellence, relevance, flexibility, and inclusivity for all children and young people. Um, it does want to kind of obviously build on excellent foundations of core subjects, uh, reading, writing, and maths. Uh, but they're also keen to kind of bring in the broader curriculum. Um, and I think this is really valuable now, is that... Uh, there seems to be a real push for the government to make sure that uh, music, art, sport, and drama are really integrally kind of uh, played. Part of that. Because that, that, and I think we've kind of discussed that a few times of um, the importance of yeah. uh, drama, art, and music, just in terms of how the brain works, and you know, um, giving like giving giving that kind of space for the uh, neurological connections to. There's loads of evidence out there about music, drama, and the expressive arts. Variety. Yeah, I think we need the variety as well. You know yourself, when, when ch children are taking the options with me and they turn around and say, parents, I always have the discussion with parents, and they go, well, I want my child to take STEM subjects. And we had Dr. Benison on recently in one of our shows. Yeah. Yeah. He was saying that the number of students taking maths at A-level has increased because the maths gets you a job. But the unsatisfaction, a number of people dropping out because they're just not 
they don't they're there because they have to be there they're not there because they want to be there and that's the difference we want learners who want to buy into learning because part of what school is doing is we don't we're not the complete and utter overhaul for these children we're our stage in their development part of our job is to get them to be able to teach themselves to teach to teach, to teach the learner and i think we've lost that because there's so much emphasis on what we do there's less emphasis on the children it's got to be about them it's got to be about their development and schools are just obsessed with their own selves. Schools have become selfish, forced to be selfish because they're competing with each other. And that's what you've seen some of the curriculum. Some of the curriculum has been set up not for the benefit of the students, but the benefit of the trusts, benefit of other people, benefit of a head of department. And I think we've lost sight of who we're actually teaching and why we're teaching it for. And I think that rationale, when somebody says to me, why are you teaching this in history? I always will have, I know why I'm teaching what I'm teaching. And we're asked that, aren't we? When Ofsted come in, they say, well, please tell yeah. me your rationale for why you're teaching that. Yeah. I yeah. would ask the government, what is their rationale behind this curriculum? It's got to start with that key point. We want a curriculum for the modern world, for our happier, more productive children that will get them back into school and will be more, make them more employable, make them um, more well-rounded. And also in the future world, we can see that they are, will be able to, 30 years down the line, remember their lessons the way that I remember mine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we've kind of kind of the the starting point's gone, hasn't it? The the, the gun's gone. Uh, we've actually got a QR code that we can put up on the screen. That uh, for anyone that does want to uh, contribute towards that review, uh, obviously you remember there's a broad range of stakeholders. So please share with uh, relevant people if you think that they'll be kind of helpful with that. Uh, particularly sometimes kind of uh, smaller entrepreneurs that kind of. You know, sometimes I meet guys that down the pub all the time and they kind of know I'm a teacher and they say, oh, God, I wish students could do this. Well, this could be an opportunity for them to um, have their say as well without kind of, you know, re holding a meeting or getting involved in a conference and stuff um, to kind of say, say what maybe smaller businesses want to, you know, five million uh, people are basically run small businesses that only employ a few people in this country. Let's hear from their view as well. Let's not hear just from the big uh, corporations and let's, let's see what kind of these people do that probably employ one or two of our students every so often into their businesses. Their kind of their, their opinions would be really valid as well. So you've got until the 22nd of November uh, this year to kind of uh, you know, log your thoughts, but I'm sure the, um, you know, um, X and other platforms, people will be sharing their thoughts kind of as they go. So uh, we're going to roll on to our second story. But before we do that, we're just going to hear from our sponsors. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. John Cat have an exceptional collection of book titles that cover a range of educational topics, ideas and research. The books are aimed at forward-thinking schools and support best practice teaching for both primary and secondary education. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Introducing Reading Solutions UK, home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development programme improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalised learning pathway built to accelerate their strengths and improve on their areas for development. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. Superb. Thank you very much uh, for your support. Um, so a second story that uh, obviously you flagged up, but oh, we've just got a kind of a comment there, so let's read out. Teenagers sick of lane teaching that doesn't excite uh, it doesn't even excite the teachers. Uh, but when the Secretary of State last listened to a passionate teacher at the chalk face, well, let's give them their dues. You know, we've got we've got to kind of take it at face value, but I, I appreciate the the comments. Um, and uh, I'm gonna take this opportunity while Brent's on mute to, to talk. So if Brent can be unmuted. 
he might he might be talking. Who knows? Um, but he kind of maybe we'll both do it. I'll just freak Lucy out if we both did it. Um, so um, it's a, head, a story that you kind of uh, you you flagged up earlier today uh, about um, teaching assistance uh, grants and um, that three in four heads are struggling to recruit recruit teaching assistants with most secondary and special schools leaders anticipating needing more to cope with rising SEND um, demand. Um, so this is obviously a big problem because as I said, these are the people that kind of, you know, we can just about survive at the minute as teachers with these kind of incredible people who step up to be teaching assistants to come into our classrooms, support people with sometimes very extreme and challenging needs. Yeah, I mean, um, I've always championed teacher assistants and um, I suppose it's the, the way I was brought up, you know, in our school, my caretaker, cleaners, all those people are... Uh, I know every one of them by name. Doesn't mean that the girls in the in the canteen do give me extra portions. Um, that's how I view my school as a community. And our TAs, some of them are way beyond the scope of a, what a teaching assistant is. And I would just read you what the government says. And it says that the, from the findings of their research, the government have done uh, that document, which we'll share. It says the findings indicate the roles and responsibilities of TA, TAs have increased in recent years. They perform a variety of tasks, support teaching and learning in addition to what might be thought of as traditional activities, such as maintaining classroom spaces and preparing resources. This frequently includes whole class, one-to-one, -one, small group support delivered in both in and out of the classroom and pupils identified with SEND. And we've also seen, which they haven't admitted, which the unions have, have flagged up, T, you know, TAs stepping in and basically delivering lessons because right. of the recruitment and retention crisis. And there is definitely that happening a lot more. Um, but as one of my longstanding TAs said to me recently, why, why, why am I doing this job any longer? I get less thanks. I get more parents emailing in. Um, I get less support. I'm asked to do more. And my son, who's 17, is getting more pay than I am. And he's working at a local supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, I've, over the... Over 20 odd years I've been teaching, I've seen some of my TAs develop into fantastic teachers. It's always been a, a sort of route that some have taken. And I think again, with the recruitment retention crisis and teaching that stream of people who go from TAs into teaching, and some do fantastically well as teachers who are former TAs, because you think about what they're asked to do, they see on a ground level, um, exactly what goes on in the classroom. And I always said to myself as an early younger teacher, the two groups of people I often asked about reflecting on my teaching practice was my teaching assistants who see all the lessons, don't they? They go into different lessons, they see different styles. And, and I'd always ask them honestly, how am I doing? How are my lessons? Is there anything I can improve upon? Um, and they always felt, you know, I can't question you, you're the teacher. No, no, tell me. And, and sometimes the, out of the teaching assistant feedback came the best feedback I ever got because they talk to the children in ways one-to-one. -one. And I know that during COVID, they suffered more during COVID because they were front-facing. They were sitting with the children more in contact while teachers were behind a desk. So again, that's probably not helped with recruitment retention that they were, I think, thrown in too often to the deep end with little sort of protection whatsoever and still asked to do a job. And then when you add in how our children returned from COVID, I think they have been front and center, much like the nurses. I think our TAs, if you the equivalent of we are the doctors, our TAs are the nurses. Um, and that sort of analogy, I, I think we cannot function without them any longer because I mean, I mean, I mean the, the basics are, I mean, we were asking these people to kind of do a very challenging job, but what was an average about 15 grand a year? Is that kind of yeah. what you're kind of hearing? I mean, that's incredible. I mean, that's incredibly low, isn't it? I mean, that's lower than you'd expect someone to be uh, doing bar work, for example. Some or... actually do some teacher assistants I know do second and third so, so again, that their, their, their resource is even stressed, more stressed by the fact that they've got to do kind of second, third and fourth jobs. Yeah. And um, yeah, these are the people who are basically there to support and they will be 
you know, there'll be kind of all the things that we've said. There'll be many kind of psychiatrists. There'll be many kind of experts in their particular discipline around, yeah. you know, dyslexia or, you know, uh, autism or whatever. They'll have these kind of uh, specialisms within it. I mean, I, I, I'm working with a fantastic um, team at the minute with um, with B, like BSL and sign and stuff because we've got um, a, a teaching a student with uh, hearing um, impairments. You know, and just being in that world, you know, they've got to, you know, they've got to be an expert in the language. They've got to be able to, uh, you know, uh, type up what I'm saying. You know, at breakneck speeds. So there's a skill there. They've got to then kind of explain it to the students in in BSL. You know, it's it's it's, it's incredibly kind of far ranging kind of skill. And then as a country, we're saying we're remunerating that with fifteen grand. I mean, it's ridiculous it, it is i mean there's some facts and figures i just want to read through some of the the actual statistics on this which are absolutely damning and and i'm gonna i'm gonna criticize actually the unions on this because i'm actually going to criticize my own union and i've had this conversation with union leadership because as a union rep i have support staff as yeah. in my union but my union's not part of the negotiating team so i'm just going to say to the unions negotiating at the moment the teaching assistance pay hurry up get on with it and maybe you should reach out to the likes of the other teaching unions which have got support staff and invite them into the pay situation because i think it's not fair that you know teachers are getting the 5.5 i think there has to be a massive uplift in teaching assistant um pay because i think the morality of it it, it sticks with me and um, when i know what the job my my teaching assistants do for the, the pay and it's, it's not the my teaching assistants are greedy they're not that type of people they're altruistic they care and my god they really care about some of these children they make fantastic relationships and connections with both parents absolutely, yeah, absolutely. and the children that they teach and the, the well of compassion the intensity of a ta as well is really tough and okay they don't have them working and all the rest of the stuff but they are on 24 you know when they're in that classroom they're in that classroom there's no no, no time for it and and they do i think go well beyond the, their actual i suppose mission creep in the way that you said is true with us teachers but 21 percent of parents reported a shortage of send in april 24 and um, according to the neu nine percent um of teachings have um say that they have only got sufficient assist teaching assistant report and the neu survey said only nine percent of teachers reported they have sufficient teaching assistant report so that's saying 91 percent of any of you are reporting that they don't have adequate teaching assistant support. Quarter parents noted a lack of TS support in their child um, and adds further evidence to GMB's findings in March 24. And they said one in five teaching assistant roles in local authority maintained schools were currently unfilled. So there's your recruitment problem. And um, despite the shortage, um, school dash data in March 24 shows an increase in demand in TS. And get this, this is the squeeze. A um, 158% rise in secondary school teaching assistant applications, which mirrors the increased demand in SEND, and 153% rise in secondary um, SEND jobs as well. So you have an increase in SEND, a decrease in recruitment, a decrease in, in teaching assistants. So there's a, de a definite squeezing there, isn't it, that then puts this pressure on us. And it's kind of a symbiotic situation of teachers are now having to cope without teaching assistance, parents getting frustrated, that erodes the relationship with some schools. And I think that leads to more complaints and leads to more stress, which I think connects to the teacher recruitment issue. So I think there is a definite symbiosis between the teacher recruitment problems and the TA recruitment problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really interesting that so maybe with this one of the things we can pick up uh, next week, so we're going to be talking back about kind of COVID and the legacy of COVID on schools. But part of this problem is, is that there was the COVID recovery money um, that obviously was that, which I didn't know, was the, largely there propping this uh, system up with TA pay um, that now has now has come to an end. And obviously that's where they kind of literally the kind of bottoms fall out of that market, hasn't it? To uh, there's no money available anymore for, for to, to to pay for it. Um so um I mean it'd be really interesting. There's a couple of two things to watch kind of coming up. One, you know, does this factor into the uh, budgets in, in a couple of weeks' time? You know, um nothing's been said about kind of uh, funding for schools, uh, particularly apart from these six thousand extra teachers. 
Uh, we don't really know kind of where that money's come from. And are, are we going, I know the Department of Education look at certain things around COVID, particularly kind of giving, um, like a call's gone out today because of maths, they're thinking about kind of going back to the maths sheets again and giving some kind of assistance and exams uh, for maths and other subjects uh, going forward. But it does seem that this kind of like legacy of COVID, obviously some of these issues, some of these issues will be health issues related to COVID, um, but some of them, obviously, you know, we now know that, you know, there's a lot more kind of uh, a social trend for people to understand their own kind of learning needs. So they are coming into school. And as far as I'm aware, there's a legal requirement for a school to, you know, look, you know, deal with that learning need whilst it's in uh, the school. Um, so with, with, with kind of doing with it, with adding no money into it and TAs kind of, I guess, getting disaffected and leaving because, you know, eventually that, you know, however, however good Swan is, 15 grand a year, you know, isn't going to pay for your increase in mortgage, your energy bills, you know, how much you love the job, eventually you're just going to run out of the pennies, aren't you, to to do the job. Um, so there needs to be a real, I'm glad you kind of pulled up the unions there because I haven't heard anything there really uh, on pay yeah. directly about, yeah. about the TAs. I mean, that, that was from Daniel Kebody himself when I spoke to him at uh, a conference. And he was like, yes, we'd like to represent because I, I have had more teaching assistants join my union at any other time. Because, I'm going to be honest, the spurious complaint nature and the vulnerability of staff is now extending to teaching assistants as well. And I've noticed a pattern developing where some parents... They're, 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 in the, they're in the firing line, essentially, aren't they, more? They are They are more in the firing line in some aspects because they are the person who is, you know, read the CHP. They, 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 you know, they are, I think, again, following some of the children around with SEND. And if it doesn't work, they, you know, they're trying to facilitate, trying to meet the needs of that child. And sometimes they can't meet the needs. I and mean, here's one example, 27% of parents... Um, reported a shortage of unqualified teachers in the classroom. TA workload is negative impact by that, but also Unison survey revealed that 25% of primary TAs had been asked to provide class cover due to not enough teachers. So some primary TAs are stepping in and delivering lessons. That is a no-no. That is not fair. And that is lead. That leads to this yeah. idea of unqualified. And, and again, hard-up schools with staffing problems are trying to put in teaching assistants who are on peanuts as basically surrogate teachers. So, 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 if, so if, I, if I was if I was a teaching assistant and the head teachers come to me and said, you know, we'd like you to cover this class, you know, what is it I'm saying? No. Just saying, I mean, like this? No. Yeah. No, for two reasons. Number one, that's putting them in a compromised situation. They're not a specialist. They're not, not a trained teacher. They're a trained teacher and they're a TA and, and they're possibly, you know, they're, they're somebody who's comfortable with doing that, then that's up to the individual. But I would advise not. No chance. Because there's the other second side of that is, right, hard up uh, trusts want to save money. Well, fine, they can just cut a job and, and, and have a, a surrogate cheap teacher. There. I'm no, I'm sorry. That is, for me, it has to be a red line. It's not fair on the teaching assistant. It's not fair on the children. And it is a deprofessionalization of our profession. And I think that would be... In an emergency situation, I can understand that some hard up head teacher might do that, but that's a slippery slope. And that is a slippery, slippery slope. I don't think we should ever put somebody in that situation. And I think, um, no, I would say I advise any teaching assistant who's been in that situation that you join a union and say that your union that is not your job. You are not a teacher, you're a teaching assistant. Okay, um, so you wouldn't, okay. But you wouldn't, so, ask, you wouldn't ask the nurse to, to be a doctor's job. Okay, so should, should they then be doing kind of admin jobs? within the school I mean, where, within where, where, reason, if it's fair i mean again and primary schools tas do a lot more of the displacement again that's what the government's saying is it has you know teacher assistants are now doing a multi variety of jobs i would say it's a context is always important a context of a school is always important the needs of the school is always important um but i would say that one of the things that's overlooked is actually teacher assistant contracts and teaching assistant contracts of what kind of contract they're on Again, the unqualified teacher status. I've had some TAs who ended up as unqualified teacher status, and you're thinking, right, whoa, 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 how much are you getting paid? I think, how do I say this sort of um, without getting myself into trouble? I think teaching assistants have been taken advantage of because um, I think their, their altruism, the same as some teachers have, and I think because they are good-natured people who want to help children, 
I think that good nature has been used against them in the same way that our good nature has been used against them. I'd say that creepage has um, reached a point where it's broken some people and, and forced them out of being a teaching assistant because it's not fair. They're not being treated right there. Yeah, not- it, 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 goes, it goes on from the article we kind of had up. Um, you know, we had uh, the article talked about kind of uh, preschool break and lunch tutors. TAs are kind of doing. Um, they're also delivering one to ones, and uh, I think fair enough. Intervention, um, you know, creating kind of resources, uh, sorting out classroom displays and um, materials, um, you know, as well as kind of. But I mean, I mean, it does say that some of them are getting paid a kind of overtime or some kind of remuneration uh, for it. But um, I think there's a kind of there's a there's a, there's a kind of as you said, it's a kind of slippery slope into, well, this person now is just a general kind of person. Dog's body. That, that can be used, well, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that can be used it can use as and when the kind of school feels there's a kind of need need within it. Uh, yeah. Rather than it being, actually, I think what we need is, we need the, um, the TA bit itself almost to be a bit like a qualified profession in itself, doesn't it? Because that would give it some status. Yeah. And that would, that would give some confidence with TAs to say, actually, no, I am a qualified TA. I am not somebody that's going to step in and do half an hour's worth of stapling uh, yeah. for a teacher who's just kind of not done it. I, I've I've had in my life um, TA, um, one particular who was a history TA, and you know, this was just amazing. Mm-hmm. She had a philosophy degree. And he used to always choke her and say, well, you know, be a teacher. And she's like, I can't control children. I'm fine. <laughs> but for my money, Liz was attached to our department. We used to have a TA attached to our department. And she became obviously a specialist then in humanities. And literally, I we bounced off each other. I was a team. We were a team. And she wasn't a teacher assistant that everybody would have liked because she was like a, basically a, like me. She was, you know, energetic let's just say energetic so the two of us together was brilliant because it's just energy 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 and not everybody like that science no chance because you know that science is so sometimes it is about matching the right teaching assistant the right teacher and that chemistry can be really really important where i could turn around and trust liz and say right you know what here you go here's a couple of historians here's a couple of children she built those relationships i'm i'm going to be honest with you she was worth a grade all the work she did in some of my there, there's one student in particular was predicted back when as A, B, C, D was predicted uh, a D. He ended up in A grade. And I'm not kidding you. The work that she did with that boy was just amazing. And literally, still to this day, when I see him out and about, he's like, I got an A in history, sir. And I'm like, mean, yeah, you got an A in history because you had that one to one from a teaching assistant who knew the curriculum and was well overqualified and I don't know if we have that level of time quality because they're being pulled left, right and centre into jobs again, like us teachers. I think like us teachers, they're being spread too thin. Well, well, should, we just, should, we just, should we just put up because we've had a, um, a comment from kind of one of our friends at Teacher Talk Radio, Paul yeah. Paz. I think he's kind of promoting something else there. <laughs> it's kind of a logo. Um, it's essentially kind of the thought is that kind of, well, you know, you know, TAs, teachers, secretaries, uh, the din lady, everybody does a little bit of something else. Um, is that a kind of is that a, is that a thing? Is that just something we have to accept now? Um, I know, I know, I know. I, I get, I get what you're saying, Paul. The, the, it's not going to work if everyone just did their own. If I just went in and just taught my business to his lessons, the whole thing would kind of fall apart. I get that bit, uh, yeah. but is, is there is there a line that's being crossed here? Um, where actually kind of the good naturedness of a TA and they they want to kind of be in a school and really help people is that being kind of um, you know pushed into things uh, that really there should be you know either a remuneration or a status linked to it because of what they're doing should it be rewarded in some way essentially is what I'm what I'm saying honestly there are more bureaucratic people in education and we are mirroring the NHS. We have more middle managers, more bureaucracy, more accountants, more PR, more HR, more people making money out of education and less teaching assistants. And that for me is it. Hmm. We need more bodies in the classroom. 
you talk about an army of teaching assistants. I'd love to have an army of teaching assistants. <laughs> we don't because we don't have an army of teaching. There's a scant army. What's left of an army is basically dad's army at the moment. We might as well have Captain Main wearing going in there because we are ruling out of quality teaching assistants. And I'm going to say something now. Don't mute me. Supply agencies. No, I'm really sorry, but supply agency teaching assistants. No disrespect. They don't have the same quality as somebody who's been in education in a school. A lot of the teaching assistants stay in an education setting for more than longer than some of the teachers. I know some of my teaching assistant colleagues are there longer than I am. I'm 21 years and they are part of a community. And I think this is connected to the way schools aren't connected to communities any longer because some of those teaching assistants are there because their children went to that school. Yeah, that's, what, have, uh, yeah, that's an important thing to mention, isn't it? That these people are, are really invested stakeholders, aren't yeah, they? They are. Uh, they, they, they are people that literally, they leave, they walk out the school gate, possibly with one of their children who are at the school, yeah. and, then, and then walk kind of 50 yards down the road. Yeah. Uh, they're, su they're such an integral part where sometimes it's true that maybe teachers do kind of come in and out of, of an area. Um, it, it's well, there's a nursery of... aspect of teaching, which is starting to happen, isn't it? Yeah. You sort of like, you come in, you're a teacher, you're there. But as I say, it worked for me when I had a teaching assistant for a few years and they got to know me, I got to know them. They got to know the kids, they got to know the parents. For me, the key thing in education is relationships. You can't build relationships with a supply teaching assistant who doesn't even know the kids, doesn't even know the area. I'm sorry, they are creaming off the profits in education. And there's far too much bureaucracy, supply agencies, supply, the, I'm, there's just money going out the door in education and I don't know where it's going, but it ain't going into the classroom. It ain't going into the wages of teaching assistants. It's not going into our wages. We need bodies in the classroom. Simple as that. We need well, bodies, let's, let's, quality let's bodies. Let's call that because I think that's a perfect kind of quote to to end things on tonight. Uh, we've, you know, it's a fantastic kind of uh, you know conversation, and I think it's mm -hmm. definitely want to kind of uh, bring up uh, but uh, thanks for listening tonight we've been uh, sponsored by um, John Katz um, uh, education uh, publisher of professional books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools okay. around the world uh, level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore a full range of titles use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order and we're also grateful to the support of uh, Reading Solutions UK. It's the home of the Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development program. Create strong readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gap and places them on a personalized learning path pathway built to accelerate their strengths and improve their areas for development. You can try the program with a free four week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot. So, thank you very much for all their support. And you can see their information uh, come across the bottom. Uh, next week, as I said, we're joined by um, Steve B, who's going to, um, we're going to look at the legacy of COVID. And so I know it's something we've kind of touched on a few times, kind of with six years, nearly six years on, are we? Five years on? Uh, from, from four, and kind of, four and a half, five years from, from kind of that first kind of outbreak. Um, so it'd be interesting to kind of just step back and have a look at that. So if we could show his face on the screen, that'd be great. So people can see who uh, Steve is. Hello, Steve. Hello, <laughs> Steve. Steve's Steve not coming on. And... Um, <laughs> And also, um, you can... Could you explain who um, Steve is then? People can't see. So could you explain who, what Steve's connection to COVID? Uh, I think I think we'll do that. We'll do that next week. Actually, we've got a quick quote. Yeah, because yeah. I've got one second left. We've got a quick quote there. Um, that's uh, J JBL says, worked with a TA who was far better than me in dealing with challenging boys who saw as a mum figure. Absolutely. I, I was thinking that when Brent was talking. There's been so many so many TAs yeah. that I've been kind of scared of uh, in, in the classroom sometimes, yeah. uh, which has been kind of fantastic. Um, obviously, you can go to thank you, uh, JBL, for all your comments, and Paul Foz as well for commenting on tonight. Um, you can go to... Uh, oh, thanks, Paul. Thank you very much. We, we Love you.
we take feedback uh, whenever we can. Thank you very much. And um, and we also, you can go on to kind of uh, the YouTube, go on to Teacher Talk Radio uh, channel, and you can see all our uh, previous and come shows. join us. And come get and join us. Get a teacher in a mug. Teacher in a mug. And we didn't get a chance to uh, discuss your rather... Uh, disappointing. Oh, no, 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 we will. No, no, we're just going to finish with that. So one of the oh, we problems do. of budget we don't, we no, don't. no, you, we don't. We, we two, don't. Have time. Three, two, no, one. no, we do not. I mean, I'm discussing this. This is happening. So there I am, organized, got myself a new classroom. Sorry, guys, so I'm trying organized. to prepare now. Eight glue sticks. No, you know I'm doing this. Eight glue sticks. I put in little boxes and it's great. And I'm thinking, oh, I've got all my retrieval tasks. I'm on this this year. I'm going to make my life a lot easier. Get organized. Whoa. And uh, kids come to me the other day, sir, um, the glues don't work. I'm like, what do you mean the glues don't work? And they pretty much were putting the glues and they were just falling out. They were going, they were mush. So the quote line for this is, I long for the day when I have a semi-hard Pritt stick as opposed to a rather flaccid completely floppy glue stick, which is cheap and nasty. Um, so um, if anybody is the manufacturer of proper glue sticks at a reasonable price, uh, I'm more than willing to, as long as they are not going to, I'm serious. It was just like kids having to go to the toilet to wash their hands. These well, glue you, sticks you, you, melted. Brent, Brent, you've had your carry on moment. Good night. Glue sticks. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.